What lies beyond our end exactly? Do we head into the dirt nap and that's it? Like going to sleep but with no dream? Or is there a form of consciousness after we pass on? Do we continue living in the next life? Well, if you believe the latter over the former, then you know in general the notion is extremely comforting, and this has also led to some issues down the line. Cults springing up, claiming to be messiahs of sorts, leading groups of people to their end have been marked all throughout history. To the outsider looking in, these people are clearly following a cult of personality and alarmingly going to their demise. But to the insider, there is no other place they'd rather be. To them, the afterlife is all but assured, and this life is really just a trial by fire sort of scenario. This has unfortunately in the past in human history created horrendous situations where mass endings have taken place, such as drinking the Kool-Aid at the Jim Jones compound. Into the future, it seems humanity has struggled with the same issues. No closer to understanding the afterlife or even if there's an existence to it that we know of, humanity would then spread out into the stars and with it, a growing cult would take hold. So, I think what I'll do with this episode is discuss what happened prior to the events of Ishimura and the hypothesized reasons I think the markers even exist as well as this cult in the first place, as there seems to be a lot of people playing Dead Space right now, which is pretty great actually, and if I sound a little tired or a little weird, I'm on like hour 40 of a 72 hour fast, get swole no matter what, so I am kind of tired. Anyways, before also getting there, I really do appreciate the support on the Roanoke Tales channel. I should have a video over the strange disappearances of the people in the Bennington Triangle near Glastonbury Mountain in Vermont. That should be coming out either like yesterday or today. So if you want to check that out, it's always appreciated and I will link it at the end of this video. All right, let's get to it. Spreading like a cancer in the beginning, it was noticed that it really wasn't much of a threat, but unitology would go on to infest the upper echelons of power all the way down to the commoner until they were completely entrenched in society. From here, they became more bold with their recruitment strategies literally calling this process indoctrination. I don't know about you guys, but I would probably be a little suspicious of that. Maybe Isaac isn't like crazy intelligent. Maybe he just knows what indoctrination means. I don't know. Anyhow, as these fanatics spread out through the stars, they would ultimately find themselves with enough resources and power to make some pretty large scale decisions that could potentially affect the rest of the species, which once a cult gets to that size, you're not gonna have a good time. Their ultimate symbol for their own rebirth into the afterlife, or being made whole so to speak, was the marker. The marker exists as a ploy to sort of lure in unsuspecting species to their doom. Like an anglerfish shining the light in the darkness, what appears to be the warm glow of free energy was actually attached to a monster with massive jaws lying in wait to snatch up anything that happened by. 65 million years ago, the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs made impact with the Earth. This would spell the end to the species that dominated the world but gave rise to the next that would dominate the stars. Small mammals would evolve into larger mammals as they filled niches left over by the absent dinosaurs until ultimately primates would come into the picture. Now something to understand is this was all by design. Think of it this way, animals live on Earth for hundreds of millions of years in complete harmony with the planet. Even when the Earth had a shakeup from volcanoes erupting to new ice ages to any cataclysmic event, the animals lived on. But once the marker arrived, that changed the entire balance. The marker, as we know it, puts out a pulse that changes the genetic coding, at least the man-made one does. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say the black marker does as well, because I'm fairly certain it does. This is intentional by the species that originally built the markers. The original marker that was sent to Earth is known as the black marker. This specific marker's job was to impact on the planet that already had life and begin molding them into something new. To this effect, the marker succeeded. Touching down the Yucatan Peninsula, it would not be discovered for some time until Michael Altman, a researcher, ended up finding it. In the area outside of the marker, the people that lived in that town would cross their fingers whenever talking about the marker as a form of sort of like what they thought was protection. But in reality, they had already been altered greatly by this chunk of rock and would not even know that they were already at their end product. The black marker's sole purpose is not only just to disrupt an animal's balance with their homeworld by making them desire more and more resources, but also apparently it seems to cause them to breed out of control as well as become more intelligent, which those things, they don't really go together, but hey, that's what happens when you section off pieces of the brain. Some of this, again, doesn't sound like such a bad thing or that bad of a gig, to be honest with you. Becoming more intelligent is pretty great, but you have to ask yourself, is it better that space is empty? or better for something to be out there. Both concepts carry their own weight depending on who you ask, but in the Dead Space universe, it's pretty apparent that it disturbed some people and with others it was a blessing because that meant humanity could do what they wanted unchecked because the stars were ours. 
As Altman found the marker and began experimenting with it, eventually someone on the team would begin turning into an infector form, showing that the black marker, if standing close enough, would alter a person, even though necromorphs had not really typically been seen on Earth. After the infector was taken out, Altman would discover that the bacteria housed within basically could completely turn you into something else, and then he inadvertently infected himself. After he realized what he did, he was compelled to go to the marker because he thought it would offer him safety, a concept seen in Dead Space Remake as sort of like a safe or dead zone for the infection and the signal as mentioned, but this isn't reality. There is no safe zone around the marker, and although it seemed to delay the infection, the security team wouldn't be taking any chances. They put Altman down before he had a chance to infect the rest of the planet. Thus launched Unitology. Seeing Altman as a martyr for the church, rather than just a dude who didn't wear proper PPE, which is big cringe, they chose to believe that he was onto something with the whole life after death thing. Which again, the highest level of the church members actually do know this, but here's the fun part. You have different levels based on how much you've given and how much you've done for the church. The highest level have all the secrets and all the truths that would probably make anyone walk away from it. But the middle and lower tiers are all donating and giving to the church so fervently that it wouldn't make any sense for the authority of the church to tell them really what's going on. And that's what makes it so cult-like. In fact, an argument can be made that the upper echelons don't even believe what they're really doing. They're just kind of like, yeah, I'm making a lot of money. I don't care. So, the people who want to move up in the church and learn more about what's going on are required to give to said church to have influence. This can come in several different ways, such as becoming a ship captain and then, I don't know, using your influence to help the church by installing more members into authority positions, or just outright giving them money. Either way, as you climb, you get told more and more about what's going on, but just shy of the whole alien bacteria thing and turning into necromorphs. But the problem with people floundering around in the dark and seeing a beacon of light is, as mentioned previously, that beacon sometimes has a massive pair of jaws with rows of teeth waiting in the darkness. When the Ishimura first discovered Aegis 7, they knew that they were not supposed to be there. It was an illegal mining operation in an illegal sector. However, Aegis 7 was too good to pass up on, and as a result, the planet cracking would commence because they were a company, after all, and they had shareholders to appease. Upon cracking that bad boy up, which is an interesting thought considering, I mean, it does appear to be a dry world, but it also appears to have somewhat of a stable atmosphere that humanity could have colonized, so why break open this world? Well, that's because it may hint that someone at EarthGov is a unitologist as well and let something slip about an old secret. Regardless of what happened, this would result in the man-made red marker to show up, but interestingly, this one seems way more aggressive probably because it's man-made. With the black marker, its influence seems to be way more subtle. It spreads out, changing the genetic coding of mammals, or really any species, like say with the Tau Volantians, who got Shreked as well. Over time, molding them into highly intelligent creatures that will eventually leave their home planet and continue spreading to become what is essentially fuel to create another Brethren Moon. But unless you got up close and personal with the black marker, it would not cause you to change to any large degree. And this is by design, because the last thing the Brethren Moons would want is for a marker to touch down on the planet that had a very low population and then have to wait forever for it to actually create another Brethren Moon. But it also needs to be noted that this still did affect people if you were in the area. In fact, it's noted that the townspeople closest to the marker had higher rates of paranoia and were a little more skittish than what would have normally been seen with regular people. Most of them had stories about seeing dead ones like all the time, but they were told not to follow them into the jungle sort of deal. And I actually went through and discussed how these people were able to survive. Now, there is a certain amount of resistance to the marker that some people exhibit, such as Ellie and Isaac, and even when Isaac helped Carver in the third game. But the big thing to understand is it's sort of like a natural selection deal. The ones that went completely insane and just sort of lost their life, obviously didn't continue breeding. So the ones that were able to resist the marker influence and stay alive and just be paranoid a little bit were able to then continue reproducing, which then created children that were also resistant to the marker. So that's why this whole town can even exist in the first place. But this effect, again, did not seem to alter them as much. But if you would like to see a more detailed breakdown of what I just discussed, that should be in the Dead Space playlist. It's nice to be covering my favorite game again. Anyhow, once discovering the marker, this would absolutely change some opinions about the divinity of this rock. Likely when a slasher blade was going through someone's face, right into there, they're probably going to be thinking to themselves, hmm, this isn't a pleasant ascension into the sky like I imagined it was going to be, and then the blade hit their medulla oblongata. 
To those that survived this outbreak on the colony, at first it began as rampant paranoia, sewer slides, and red rums. Yeah, don't blame me. Blame the new policy changes on this site. This would overwhelm security forces extremely quickly, pushing them back to their stations as the general public was left to contend with the increasingly aggressive neighbors. Eventually, however, a tipping point would be reached. As security struggled to get things under control, which they never actually accomplished on the colony, they would radio up to the Ishimura about what was happening, to which then, literal monsters began showing up. At first, it was just a few here and there, but as the bodies from earlier began to change and contort in the presence of the signal emanating from the marker, they would eventually get back up and start stacking more bodies around them. At first, the ways were relatively clear, kind of. I mean, even the flesh growing on the wall was seen at the beginning of Dead Space Extraction before anything big took off. But as more and more people dropped, a new strange substance would start growing even more out of control. On the walls, on the floor, on the ceiling. And this was just confined to around the marker at first, but now it was everywhere. Taking samples from it, they would discover this cancerous growth had human DNA in it, but it had been altered to become what would allow it to grow on the walls as seen. Because if you didn't know, human cells can't actually grow very well outside of the body. You need a lot of chemical interaction within the body for cells to properly grow. And the only thing that we can really grow concerning human tissue in any large degree are actually cancer cells. So that's because they just want to grow by themselves. Uh, cancer can, you know, suck it. The mass of flesh and bone growing everywhere would soon be regarded as an atmosphere changer at first, but what it was actually heralding was something much worse. The more flesh that was added, the more it began to consume and control all in the presence of the marker. It wouldn't be long before the colony would be lost to the marker. Dr. Kine, Dr. Mercer, and Captain Benjamin Matthias would collectively watch what was going on in the colony below and arrive at very different conclusions. While Mercer and Matthias were on the same page, Kine began to see the marker as a trap. It was meant to lure species to their doom rather than the ascension that they were all promised, and he would see nothing holy about the creatures created. Despite what was happening on the colony, the Ishimura would still bring the marker up but not allow anybody else to come up because they thought it was maybe just an infection outbreak and the marker itself was clean. But the authority of the ship was blinded by the prospect of having found this holy relic, so they didn't look and be like, hmm, what did we just unearth like a week ago and how is this happening now? Anyways, Kind wanted a chance to study the marker and the outbreak, but would grow to regret his compliance in bringing what basically amounts to space aids on board. Having seen the actual rows of teeth behind the light, Kind would attempt to render the captain unfit for duty, but would be attacked by the captain, which resulted in a needle in his eye that would then pierce the ocular cavity and enter his frontal lobe, causing massive internal hemorrhaging, resulting in his momentary end. Because don't worry, nothing stays gone on the Ishimura for long. Because of this, Kind was forced to run as security tried to take him in, even though they just saw him get attacked and it was clearly an accident. Understanding that he just took out a unitologist in a position of power because he himself being one, he would then evade security while the ship continued descending into chaos. So that actually worked out in his favor because, hey, it's a ship. It's a finite area. They were definitely going to find him otherwise. But the exact thing that was happening on the colony was now happening on the Ishimura. There were pockets of resistance at first with the mining deck having the most success and keeping the necromorphs at bay. But just like the rest of the ship, they too were eventually overwhelmed. Others would attempt to run around preventing their decaying orbit into the planet, actually undoing the work by those attempting to save the rest of the species by crashing themselves into Aegis 7 so the Necromorphs couldn't spread. And one of these people is you. Why are you fixing the ship? Let it crash into the planet. Isaac already had issues with the Unitologists after his mother was indoctrinated into becoming one. Having given up all of their money, this forced Isaac to sort of fend for himself in one way or another as he grew up in poverty as a result. Eventually, he was able to get himself into an engineering school on his own dime and left home to escape unitology. However, this would not all work out for the better. After meeting Nicole Brennan, she would counsel his mother away from the church, which at this point, it appears Isaac had his mother on some sort of watch because he was afraid of what she might do. Having seemingly reached her, Nicole would declare that Isaac's mother was removed from the church and that she was no longer a danger to herself. Except, surprise, surprise, indoctrination can be something that's kind of hard to break. She was apparently faking it or just had a conflict arise within her own psyche shortly afterwards. This would prompt her to go out and then take Isaac's father out as well as herself. And had she been given the chance, likely Isaac would have fallen into this as well, but he was away at the time. Obviously, Isaac would be a little bit upset about this. He called Nicole to tell her what happened, then essentially blamed her for the whole thing. 
It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Grief can make you say like some really stupid things, but Nicole's response was pretty terrible as well, as she would tell him to go to hell. I mean, obviously Isaac wasn't thinking correctly, but this resulted in a schism between the two. As soon as the call ended, Isaac realized that he just had a certified hash brown moment and would likely keep trying to get into contact with Nicole, but, you know, sort of like calling your ex-girlfriend, uh, they usually don't pick up. Eventually, he would assume it to be a stroke of luck, but let's be real here, nothing about this was lucky. The Ishimura would need repairs, but really, this was likely a distress call seeing as what was happening at the Ishimura at this point. He would then lock and load Brides of Christ with the Kellington crew and then be dispatched to the Ishimura to attempt to fix their comms issue, but really he didn't know anyone there and was just sort of the odd man out. Another odd woman out would be joining the team known as Kendra Daniels. Daniels was an unknown to the Kellington crew, but that doesn't mean there was any reason to suspect her of anything. They were just there for a repair mission and that's about it. But this is also why I believe someone at EarthGov let something slip to a unitologist about the red marker, as there was no reason for her to tag along otherwise. Because how would she know about the marker if internally someone didn't tell her that they needed to go there to rectify the mistake that somebody else did telling the unitologist to go there? Hopefully you've played Dead Space already. I mean, it came out in 2008. Uh, so I'm not really sure how much of a spoiler that is. Anyways, upon arriving at the Ishimura is an absolute bloodbath. It is said that there's a thousand people on board. Why would nobody pick up the phone? But somebody did. You can hear them gurgling in the background. And the rest have been turned into either like the meat paste on the walls or floors. And the marker's influence is now piloting their bodies around on the ship after the infection took hold. So... Those are about your two options. The ultimate goal of this outbreak is to convert every single person within the ship and colony into a homogenized clump of cells that then can be used to create a larger version of what is needed. This is the marker's ultimate goal. However, given that half the people were on the colony and the other half were still on the Ishimura at this point, there is likely not enough biomass to quickly create a Brethren Moon, but that does not stop the marker from trying. This could suggest that while the biomass available was not sufficient in making a Brethren Moon, given enough time, the cells would keep dividing, and as a result, eventually a moon would be formed from the crust of the planet and the people that were absorbed already, which I will get into that a little later on in the video. Either that, or the marker is not so much controlled by an outside influence, but instead is much like any other machine. It continues running as long as everything is going according to a set operational standard. However, I believe there still is a certain amount of connection to the marker itself, and I'm pretty sure that's confirmed by the lore as well. As Isaac makes his way through the ship, repairing functions to keep them from crashing into the planet, which is what the marker wants despite the fact that it will probably destroy the planet because the planet crack, we begin to see the influence of the marker firsthand. Beyond just the necromorphs, Isaac begins learning about how else it influences the bodies of those that it's affecting. With the infectors serving as the reanimators, witnessing the captain being turned into a slasher, it's clear that if this gets out, all of Earth will be doomed. And not just that, but one slasher was able to overwhelm a military ship. But what he doesn't realize is, by trying to fix this issue, he's subtly being manipulated by the marker the whole time. While this manipulation can result in things like headaches, fear, paranoia, and aggression, for Isaac, believed largely to be due to his intellect, he sees symbols and numbers, so the brain is spared the madness most succumb to. The marker at this point is affecting his very genetic coding, turning him slowly into one of the monsters on board and rearranging his brain meat. One hallucination at a time. Assuming this to be an internal idea that he had at first, returning the marker to the world was the thing to do, which was also confirmed by Nicole as well. So everything seemed to be coming up Millhouse despite issue after issue cropping up, attempting to stop this from happening. It almost seems like maybe that should have been an indicator for not doing that, but hey, it is what it is. Loading up the marker and retrieving Kine and Kendra, Kendra then go on to betray Isaac and take out Kine. Her intentions weren't to just let him expire as she assumed he could find another way off the ship, but she also left him with like a ton of monsters and they couldn't find another ship past that. In fact, Hammond had to tell them about this ship. So I think basically, I mean, she did kind of leave him to, you know, meet his end. Kendra then goes on to tell him that this was an EarthGov marker that was left here in quarantine so nobody could find it, which would have been in humanity's best interest. It was actually based on the alien black marker that was found back on Earth. She was sent to retrieve it with a conditional ship known as the Valor, basically there to nuke everything should it get out of hand. Although they were probably just going to nuke the ship anyways once Kendra was clear. Kendra then takes off as Nicole radios Isaac to come up to the flight deck so they can recall the ship, which Kendra then nopes out in an escape pod and Isaac gets back on board and heads down the direction of Nicole. Once getting down to Aegis 7, the state of the planet is finally shown. Barren and lifeless, a small colony was set up on the edge of the planet crack and would serve as the miners' home for the time being. After the outbreak, large growths grew everywhere, the same as on the Ishimura. 
Necromorphs were then all over the place, having apparently been down there for a very long time. As Isaac returns the marker back to its pedestal, he is told the entire like time by Nicole that there's like this dead zone that'll protect him. And considering all the research that she was doing and that he saw her doing on the marker, he really had no reason to not believe her. Of course, if my wife started saying cryptic things like make us whole, I might begin to suspect her a little bit. That, mm -hmm, you know, something might be going like weird here. I don't know. But once returning it, he would then go on to activate the gravity tethers to get out of there. But then Kendra would finally make her appearance and then section him off. It is shown that the marker has great influence over how the mind operates at this point. I mean, with Kendra, she kept seeing her little brother, right? Who had expired at some point long ago, which was obviously distressing to her. For Isaac, he saw Nicole the whole time helping him to get the marker back to the pedestal because it was going to save them all. For Cross, she saw Jacob Temple, a person she was intertwined with, and that she was basically helping him get the marker back to the pedestal. Kind saw his wife Amelia helping him as he relayed they needed to return the marker back to Aegis 7. For this to take place, obviously these are hallucinations, but it's also going to have to change the functionality of the occipital lobe in the back of the head because otherwise you would still see what you would normally see. And then once that illusion is broken, your mind can no longer unsee it. It's sort of like that stupid, uh, what is it? Blue and black dress versus white and gold from back in the day. I don't know, I saw white and gold. Anyways, the whole time the marker was dictating to them that they needed to return it for their safety, but in reality, it was the start of a convergence event that would spell their undoing. So what is a convergence event, I hear you asking? I'm glad you asked. Convergence is the ultimate goal of the marker, and to understand it, we actually have to jump ahead to Dead Space 3. There are these things called Brethren Moons, and I mentioned them just a little bit earlier, but the Brethren Moons' main and only goal is to increase their network and cleanse the galaxy of all life, basically turning it into them. Basically, the galaxy is just a giant farm to these creatures. One moon-sized creature is composed of a single species and the surface and atmosphere of that planet that it goes to absorb. This makes them whole, but not in a way that would be worth being a part of, at least in my opinion. So the question is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? See, the Brother and Moons could have always existed, but then the question becomes, how do they create markers? I have mentioned this in a previous episode, but it's been a long time, so I'll just sort of restate my stance on this. I believe the marker was not created by a Brother and Moon, but was actually created by an ancient species. This species, like all species, was likely looking for untapped energy that they could use much like humanity would do. It's possible that this species was the first to grow outside of their home world and were the original, use all the resources on this planet and then move to the next kind of beings. Over time, they would likely realize that there was an energy in the universe that didn't come from the sun or like a molten core or anything that they could see, but it was measurable. This background energy likely came from a higher dimension, at least on how I'm thinking, which by the way, I don't like, I don't, I didn't mention this, did I? But we're kind of going to get out there with some of this stuff. So just uh, come along for the ride, I suppose the best way to say it. But I believe this helps explain why the markers exist in the first place if the infectious bacteria does as well. To harness this energy, a conduit would be needed. The marker served this purpose to capture this energy, focus it, and make it usable within our universe. But the issue with energy is, if it's not understood, it can have effects that you didn't consider at first. Uh, look at the demon core, for instance. I mean, much like with radiation damaging our genomes, exposure to this energy clearly has a similar effect. This initial species would continue to make more and more of these markers as it empowered their technology, but over time, it seems something would take notice. The problem with the concept of higher dimensions is we do not know exactly what's out there. I mean, take a one-dimensional being, right? And let's say for argument's sake that it was sapient. Like, they can only see in one dimension, so just height, that's it. Then, have them try to understand a three-dimensional being. It would seem that, say, us, for instance, would phase in and out of existence because it's beyond the perception of one dimension. It couldn't comprehend the other two dimensions in which we inhabit. So it would see like a sliver of us that could disappear if we moved anywhere. So now take us as a three-dimensional being and try to comprehend a fifth-dimensional being. It would seem that this species could phase in and out of existence as well because we cannot comprehend two dimensions above our own. Again, I know that there's a point to all this that I'm going to make here in a second. This energy that was likely detected but not understood could potentially be coming off of something that is a higher dimensional plane of existence than our own, meaning we would never see it, but could easily see this species sort of like we could easily see a one-dimensional species. 
having their energy used, this opened the doorway for this hypothesized species to interact on our level, which at this point, we don't know what their motives are or what they would even be, and if we could even understand them in the first place. But at this point, their fate was sealed. Slowly, their own coding would be altered and changed until they became monsters themselves. This would result in a convergence event where their entire species was assimilated. Once assimilated, you can kind of think of this like the Brethren Moons as being controlled by a higher dimensional being. Each one gets their own species, so to speak. These markers would then be flung out into the universe depending on how many were created, which would then touch down on other planets that either contained already intelligent life or budding intelligent life. The original imprint of the first species would be used as the Brethren Moons maintain a connection to the markers so that the genetics of like that planet would begin shifting into a pattern like the original species that made the markers. Over time, like hundreds of millions of years, other species would then fall to the marker to create Brethren Moons until finally it was humanity's turn. EarthGov would do as every other species did before and create the marker, but would figure out quickly that this was not the thing to mess with and would attempt to hide it. Why they didn't destroy it is probably because they just wanted it to be gone as quick as humanly possible. It seems like coming into our universe or dimensional plane, and again, I know, I know how it sounds, but this is like the best way I can make it make sense because it's like this energy isn't just going to exist for no reason and then the markers aren't just going to exist because they exist, right? But it seems like the Brethren Moons are at least somewhat omniscient, but it does seem like there is an absolute limit to kind of everything that they know, at least within our galaxy. Because they did not know the location of Earth until after the Tau Volantian Brethren Moon was destroyed, and they needed Isaac and Carver to basically exist long enough for them to glean that information from their brain. Which again is why I think they're just a higher dimensional being, as they are able to warp drive to Earth with just their bodies, which is phasing in and out of our understanding of existence, and then appear at random for what we assume to be is random. All this is to say that the marker itself is not a living being capable of its own thought, but instead it's just a tool or conduit clearly showing the goals and motivations of another species that I do not believe we can really comprehend. But judging by its actions and the fact that it's self-serving, it's clearly predatory. Now, that was kind of a crazy thing to kind of throw out there like, oh, well, this higher dimension is predatory. Well, I mean, if predators can exist within our own dimension, why can't they exist within other dimensions? Humans would be tricked into worshipping this energy or species because we assumed it to be above our species and would bring us into the afterlife. However, the reality was, yes, our tissue would go and would be pushed by the marker's energy to reanimate, but no human consciousness was to be found. Instead, every infected individual is like a micro version of a brother and moon to which the species on the other side of the marker can control and influence to create the things it needs to fully inhabit within our dimension how the marker is capable of this is actually quite interesting again i have an older video over this but essentially when your mind ceases to be typically your body would follow suit after the chemical reactions also stop this results in your cells and your body expiring and that's usually all she wrote on it however Dropping within the marker presence presents a much different effect. While the body stops communicating with hormones because really nothing is directing it, a new process begins as it takes over the communication, but also takes over the metabolism. So think of it this way, rather than a cell to cell communication leading to life and a cell keeping itself alive by nutrients coming in and then using those nutrients to make ATP, basically the cell is leading to life. The marker assumes the role of the brain and all the nutrition essentially dictating to every cell what to do in the body and how to perform. Again, this is why I believe there was a species prior to the Brother Moons that built the markers as their way of overcoming limitations of even something like a Dyson Sphere. Because our universe didn't appear to have enough energy and they needed more and more resources. They would eventually find this background energy and then use it. This would expand to whatever empire that they had, which might be beyond belief based on our own understanding. And this was until the higher beings took notice. And they're higher as in higher dimension. Uh, they can catch the boot like every necromorph. But it's sort of like a mouse stealing food from a human grain silo sort of scenario. Once you notice it, you're screwed. Once the marker has control of the cells, it changes the coding at first and has been doing so the entire time so that the cell functions differently. Even in death of the person, the cell itself is still living as the marker has the ability to change them into infectors and slashers and different forms later on, which we'll be running down in future episodes for nostalgia's sake. But this is why when you drop, your cells are still alive, your consciousness is gone, and this is why it requires this process because your brain is also still struggling for control even though things are changing in your body. But 
It just takes a lot longer and it will eventually result in that person dropping because they will take themselves out because the brain itself is also changing. But for now, the marker also provides energy for the cell so that it is no longer reliant on nutrition, which is also, I believe, the cells within the corruption can eventually continue to grow into a brother and moon as minerals from the crust are taken by the cells to divide. And the energy for the marker is provided so that it can also continue to divide on that, making it seem like a lot of this like gross stuff growing on the wall is coming out of nowhere. But in reality, it's just happening differently from what we would consider normal. So again, I believe your tissue was never truly dead once you die in the presence of the marker. Your consciousness just is, which is why unitology is a cult, because if your consciousness doesn't continue on, then what's the point of convergence? That's what created the cognitive dissonance within the cringe Matthias and Mercer, as they saw this and thought, oh, maybe we didn't understand it, whereas Kine was based and understood that this was not the work of some divine being, but a predatory something that we could not even begin to comprehend. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave me a like would be great, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. Let me know what you thought about this. Also, next up on the chopping block is the actual biology of these guys. It's funny, I went back and watched my older videos where I say, oh, now I write better and my audio doesn't sound like trash. Both of which are still very untrue to this day now. Uh, so that was kind of funny. Anyways, so it's uh, going to be a uh, way more in-depth sort of breakdowns than the old ones, as I feel like I know more now. But I'll drop Roanoke Tales, my Twitter, Patreon, and Discord in the description for all those that are interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you, as always, to our astronaut, Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you, man. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, and Phoenix, as well as our scientists, Countryside Limbo, Lacune, and Logan Satomi. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help is greatly appreciated, and you are cool guys. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.